Welcome to our first installment of The Fish Keeper's Guide, a series where we aim to explain a specific aspect of fish keeping in detail, dispel any myths, and maybe even teach you something you didn't know before. Today, we'll be discussing filtration. We'll be covering everything from what exactly filtration is, why you filter, the types of filters there are, and much more. Sit back and enjoy our Fish Keeper's Guide to Filtration. In order to explain filtration, it is important to explain the nitrogen cycle and how it works in the home aquarium. The nitrogen cycle is the circulation of nitrogen in various forms throughout nature, and these nitrogenous compounds are broken down, converted, absorbed, and recycled. Aquariums, however, lack the aspects necessary, such as massive amounts of plants and other organisms, that allow the process to be more self-sustaining and harmonious. In the aquarium, ammonia, which is NH3, is produced by fish breathing or excreting waste, or rotten, leftover food, or decaying plant matter and other organic materials. It is the most toxic metabolite to fish in a vacuum and should test out as zero parts per million in your tank. It is consumed by certain types of bacteria, such as Nitrosomonas or Nitrospira, among others, and converted into nitrite, which is NO2, chemically speaking. Nitrite is still toxic, however, and it isn't safe for nitrite to build up in any level in your aquarium. That's why different types of bacteria, such as Nitrobacter, consume this nitrite and convert it into significantly less toxic nitrate, NO3. Nitrate is the end of the line in your aquarium, practically speaking. Anaerobic bacteria convert nitrate into nitrogen gas, which then bubbles out into the atmosphere, although it is advised to not create too many anaerobic conditions. The reason for this being that anaerobic conditions in undisturbed parts of the substrate can then build up other toxic compounds which are harmful to animals. Uptake via plants, removal through water changes of course, or certain filtration medias are the only ways other than water changes to remove nitrate. So with a crash course in the nitrogen cycle under our belts, let's talk about filtration. What even is it? What's the point? To put it simply, filtration is what makes keeping fish in a glass container possible. Filtration is when you push water through various medias designed to catch particulates, absorb chemicals, or house nitrifying bacteria to efficiently convert toxic conditions and keep your water healthy and hospitable for aquatic life. Other than the aquarium itself, it is the most important tool in your fish keeping arsenal. You certainly can't keep fish alive and healthy without some form of filtration in all but a few rare cases. Although certain conditions do allow for unfiltered tanks, these are the exception to the rule. It is important to note that without filtration media, filters are essentially just big glorified water movers. There are three different types of filtration, and all filter medias use at least one type. These types of filtration are chemical, mechanical, and biological, which we'll explain here. Have you ever used a fish net? Water can freely pass through the net, but fish or other solid objects are trapped inside. That's mechanical filtration. It is the simplest form of filtration. Water is pushed through some medium, like a sponge, pad, or fiber, in order to catch larger excess particles in the aquarium, such as leftover food, decaying plant matter, or large fish waste. It is then manually cleaned, rinsed off, or just left to allow biological processes to break it down and convert it to nitrate. The most notable use for mechanical filtration is its ability to polish your water, which means that it can increase the clarity of your water by capturing different kinds of particulates suspended in the water column. Many different types of mechanical filtration exist to just polish water and increase clarity, such as filter floss. Mechanical filtration is simple, easy, and helpful at every stage of an aquarium's lifespan. We personally don't think there's ever a situation where mechanical filtration isn't going to be helpful. While bacteria are often sturdier than most realize, for optimal bacterial health, we do recommend rinsing or squeezing out mechanical filtration in tank water, matching the parameters from whence it came. Next up is chemical filtration. This form of filtration refers to any filtering substance that is designed to change the chemical composition of the water, and most often refers to the use of activated carbon or other cleaning resins designed to absorb a variety of toxic or otherwise harmful compounds. Specific chemical absorbing pads also exist that help with the removal of certain compounds such as phosphates or ammonia. 
Chemical filters are a nice thing to include in any filtration system, but they should never be relied on exclusively. Though some chemical filters can be recharged, so to speak, and reused multiple times like Purigen, they do still have limited capacity, and that means they can only absorb so much before they stop being effective. Unlike some mechanical filtration, like a sponge, you can't just squeeze them out to keep them going, and they do need to be replaced when appropriate. To maximize their use, we do recommend replacing them at least every few weeks, or as determined by thoroughly careful testing. Please do note, however, that if you have sick fish and are treating your aquarium, chemical filtration may not be your friend. Chemical filters can often absorb medication introduced into the aquarium and render your treatment useless. We do recommend removing chemical filtration from your filter when treating fish. It's our opinion that chemical filtration is typically at its most useful in the beginning stages of an aquarium, when your bacteria aren't as established and the water quality is a bit less stable. However, as your aquarium ages and the bacteria gain a more solid foothold in your tank, mechanical and biological filtration tend to be very effective, although additional chemical filtration is always nice. Finally, we have biological filtration, the most important of the three kinds of filtration. This method of filtration relies on the nitrifying bacteria that are present in your aquarium to consume and convert the waste produced by your fish and decaying matter into nitrate. Much like they make life in a, an aquarium possible, these countless species of bacterium are what makes it also possible for fish in nature to live in streams, lakes, creeks, and rivers. They're the foundation of the nitrogen cycle. Biological filtration usually takes the form of a porous substance, usually made of sponge, pumice, plastic, or other materials. The porous nature of these materials provide an incredibly large surface area for nitrifying bacteria to inhabit. Of course, given that most aquarists strive for a thriving community aquarium, that's where filters come in to do the heavy lifting. Water will always be passing through biological filtration and turning over the media, allowing the nitrifying bacteria inside to have constant access to waste to consume and convert. Biological filtration needs to be built up over the course of an aquarium's lifespan. At its weakest when just starting up, it's best supplemented with chemical filtration as well as mechanical filtration. As the biological system in your tank strengthens, more emphasis on biological filtration should be made. Please do note that many bacteria and microorganisms also keep your aquatic environment stable, not necessarily just nitrifying bacteria. While many bacterial starter cultures are available in a retail setting, patience is of course key to keeping an established, healthy environment. There are many different styles of filters out there that incorporate the three forms of filtration in different ways and are useful for a variety of different styles of fish keeping. Here's a brief overview of some of the more commonly used types of filters in the aquarium hobby. We'll start with the hang on back, or sometimes referred to as HOB or HOB. It's one of the most common and easily accessible filters. As the name suggests, this filter hangs on the back of an aquarium and sucks water in via a siphon tube and impeller and cascades it back into your tank. This filter is suited for most community aquariums and provides a good amount of flow and oxygenation. The filtration it uses are mechanical, chemical, and biological in most instances. The pros of this type of filter are that they're easily accessible and found. They're pretty affordable. You can, of course, customize the types of filtration media placed within, and they're pretty easy to maintain, as well as typically having a long lifespan. They're fairly compact and don't detract too much from the look of an aquarium. However, some of their cons are that they aren't always the best choice for nano or planted tanks, given that they can suck small things up, or particularly large tanks where they just typically aren't quite as efficient. Next, we'll talk about canister filters. Just like hang on back filters, they're pretty easily accessible and can be found for sale in most retail stores, though they do tend to be a bit more expensive. Canister filters are a sealed unit that usually have two hoses that hook to the back or the sides of the aquarium. Water is then sucked through one hose, pushed throughout the entirety of the canister, and of course the variety of media inside of it, and then deposited back into the aquarium. This filter is typically suited for larger aquariums and tanks with large bio loads. The filtration media they use are typically, again, mechanical, chemical, and biological, though 
you can customize them quite easily within their chambers or filtration trays. Their pros are that they are very efficient, they're well suited for particularly large aquariums, they're again very customizable depending on exactly what you want to place into them, and they sometimes can even include heaters and be a bit more compact and out of the way. The cons are that they are typically more expensive than other filtration options. They're not always easy to find or the best option for small aquariums. They can sometimes be a bit more difficult to maintain, and they're typically physically quite large compared to other types of filters. Next up, we'll cover sponge, matten, or other air-powered filters. One of the cheapest and most efficient forms of filtration, air-driven filters rely on air, provided by an external pump, to drive the whole filtration process. Using that external pump, air is pushed through airline tubing down into the filter. This escapes from the tubing and rises back up to the surface, which in turn creates a gentle suction which pulls water through a porous sponge. Certain other or older iterations of this technology were made of plastic and can be filled with whatever media the user desires. These types of filters are well suited for all sizes of aquarium and are the filter of choice for large scale operations due to the fact that you can efficiently power multiple filters off of one appropriately sized air pump. Here at the wet spot, we run sponge filters on every sales tank so that we can filter tanks separately and off of one powerful pump. They use both mechanical and biological filtration styles, and some of their pros include the fact that they're typically affordable, they're easy to run, and extremely efficient biological filtration. In addition, their gentle suction is great for shrimp or small fish tanks by virtue of nothing can really get sucked into them. I like to run sponges in my own fish room for the reason that they also will grow beneficial microfauna that small fish or fry can eat. The cons of this type of filter is that it does detract from aesthetics a bit, and of course the physical tank space. They're not particularly customizable, and some formats of them can be a little expensive. Under gravel filters are an older form of filtration. Much like sponge filters, they're typically powered by air, but can also be hooked up to a power head. An under gravel filter is a plastic tray with slits in it that sits at the bottom of the aquarium underneath the gravel. Air is pumped into it, again similar to a sponge filter, and the process of doing so slowly pulls aquarium water through the substrate to be processed by the bacteria living below. Though they're not as commonly used today as they once were, they are still an exceedingly efficient filter and are suitable for any aquarium that you can properly fit one in. They do use mechanical and biological filtration methods, and some of their pros are that they are a very, very good filter for biological filtration. They can handle large bio loads, they're pretty easy to use and maintain, and they're also fairly well hidden of course by the aquarium gravel. Some of their cons, which have led to a prolonged period of unpopularity of course, are that you can't really use sand on them, and plant options are going to be limited since many plants will not be able to root properly and thrive. Maintenance, when it is required, does sometimes require really digging into the unit and possibly upsetting the stable balance of the aquarium.
Lastly, we'll cover sumps, which are popular for their ability to hide the filtration process and increase water volume while keeping the tank trim and neat. Sumps work by sucking water via an overflow box or drilled holes into a separate system altogether below the main tank and pushing that water through many kinds of media and then having it pumped via a return pump back into the aquarium. They're often used in larger freshwater systems or saltwater aquaria, but they can be used on any system provided a keeper creates one. They're a very good way to increase dissolved oxygen and they're very customizable and efficient. They do possibly use all three forms of filtration, mechanical, biological, and chemical. And some of their pros are that they're infinitely customizable, they're fairly easy to maintain, they can increase the overall tank volume, and as mentioned before, attractively hide the actual filtration process. The cons of these are that they're often expensive if they're prefabricated, there is the possibility of flooding if the pump fails, and will sometimes require an overflow box or drilled tank to operate, which is an additional cost for the keeper. There are a lot of myths out there in regards to filtration, so before we wrap up this video, let's take the time to address a few. Firstly, if my tank is filtered, do I need to do water changes? Yes! Filters aid the nitrogen cycle with the conversion of ammonia and nitrite to nitrate. Nitrate is of course not easily converted, and you should never rely on chemical filtration to do the job for you. To be frank, the sheer number of plants that would also be needed to consume all the nitrates produced in a normal community tank is unrealistic for the average fish keeper. A weekly water change of anywhere between 20 to 40% is typically recommended, no matter how big and mighty your filter may be. Older aquarium literature, published before filters were commonly available, actually do have recommendations for stocking in unfiltered tanks, and of course while possible, there's no filters in nature after all, at least not electrical ones, we do find it easier and more pleasant to simply filter a tank and stock a bit more to taste. Ditto for Wallstad method aquariums. Myth 2. Is there such thing as too much filtration? Well, yes and no. To put it simply, you can never really have too much filtration on a biological level. If waste is being produced, it of course is always recommended that the waste is then processed and taken care of. However, you should be aware of your fish's preferences and choose your filter accordingly. Of course, a very large filter that would work quite well on a small tank may not be most appropriate for something a bit more slow moving or finny like a betta or certain micro fish and other animals that traditionally come from slower flowing or still water habitats. Conversely though, there are fish that actually would require more filtration or water movement in some instances than you may necessarily think. Many open water or hill stream animals, of course, don't always need from a biological standpoint additional moving water or oxygenation, but it is always appreciated, I've found. Myth 3. Can you do without filtration altogether? Filters are an important part of keeping an aquarium running healthy. It's not recommended to not run any form of filtration at all on an aquarium or small body of water. It is true that some species of fish, such as bettas or paradise fish or other anabantoids, are better equipped than others to live a quote-unquote muckier or dirtier lifestyle, but the vast majority of aquarium fish need a filter to live a long and prosperous life, and even those that don't necessarily need one will be happier and typically healthier with an appropriate filter on their tank. Unfiltered, unheated fish bowls are something to be avoided. As stated, the sheer number of plants, of course, necessary to keep water clean and nitrites at acceptable levels in an unfiltered aquarium are unrealistic for the average fish keeper and average system. That wraps up our first installment of the Fish Keeper's Guide. Thanks for joining us, and of course, if there's a specific topic you'd like for us to cover next, please comment below along with any questions you might have regarding filtration. You can, of course, also contact us through our website, shoot us a message on Facebook or Instagram, or better yet, come visit our retail location here in Portland, Oregon. All links will be left in the description below. Thanks again for watching, everyone, and happy fish keeping.